Hello, and thank you for your interest in today's session titled Managing Drug Inventory During a Pandemic. My name is Perry Flowers, and I'm with BD. I serve as Vice President of Medical Affairs. Bringing over 29 years of health system experience, I lead the Enterprise Medication Management Group within Medication Management Solutions, a group here at BD. Allow me please to introduce my distinguished colleague and fellow presenter today, Donia Dimitri, a pharmacist, researcher, and author. Her primary practice areas include hospital and health system clinical care and operations, clinics, and certainly has excelled in the field of pharmacy informatics. Welcome, Donia. Today's agenda for managing drug inventory during a pandemic will focus on three key areas, a central review of pandemic epidemic challenges, navigating in the moment, and then prepping for healthcare enemy number one, COVID-19. The information contained in this presentation is based on published guidelines as well as internal clinical expertise. The implementation of this information is at the sole discretion of the hospital or health system based on established policies and procedures. Before Donia and I begin this presentation first, please permit me to send a heartfelt thank you to all those caregivers, frontline clinicians, first responders, caring for the many COVID or presumptive COVID positive patients. And to those specifically in epicenters, I recognize every health system answering the call to care. Thank you. So as we look at the challenges and goals during a pandemic, it doesn't take long to find any number of, of headlines that capture the surge and its impact. PPE, vents, trained personnel, or even medications. And we could have filled this page with, with even only headlines from your local newspaper. We picked a couple that just I, that really exemplify and the reference around individual medications, specifically a couple that talk about vent ventilators and their demands, especially with this disease state, and a, a very one-to-one uh, -one relationship with vent to the medications themselves. But Donia, diving a little bit deeper into the challenges, would you highlight some of these specific challenge areas? Certainly. Thank you, Perry. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly challenged our society and healthcare system in many new ways. Even in geographic areas that frequently manage natural disasters, such as fires or hurricanes, and have very experienced disaster managers, the current crisis requires a new set of rules and playbooks. Let's take a look at some of those new concepts. First, employee safety has become one of the most serious issues in this pandemic. A key principle in keeping staff safe is to limit traffic in and out of a facility. And by extension, that is also true in the pharmacy and other departments. During normal operations, hospitals typically touch their drug inventory at least once a day, whether ordering, refilling, et cetera. In a pandemic, the safety strategy of limiting the number of trips to, let's say, automated dispensing cabinets by increasing inventory of critical meds limits staff exposure to high-risk areas in the hospital. Second, We've learned that in a pandemic, supply needs can change very quickly, sometimes within hours. As a facility rapidly becomes overwhelmed with high acuity patients that require many interventions. And as those interventions increase, supplies such as swabs, IV lines, and drugs can be very quickly depleted. Keep a tight list 
of those critical supplies with a minimum of daily updates on inventory levels. Adjust PAR levels up for those drugs and supplies proactively because historical PAR levels won't be sufficient to meet the anticipated surge demand. As an example, some organizations have reported increases of four to five times historical inventory run rates for some drugs and supplies. Finally, leverage recent regulatory allowances to maximize all drug supplies on hand. For example, beyond to use dating considerations and centralizing some sterile compounding and distribution activities as addressed by new FDA and other organizational guidance. Perry, as we consider this concept of surge planning, what other input can healthcare leaders use to manage demand in these situations? Well, I think healthcare systems would have to look at a lot of different places, Adonia, looking at um, pre-planning. We have the luxury with this particular pandemic to have a little bit of forewarning as to what might be coming. Looking at data uh, from other locations or certainly one area, looking at a New York or response or um, China or South Korea or others. But we could also turn to relatable data that would serve as a proxy marker for some of this demand. Um, being displayed is uh, data from the CDC looking at COVID-like illness and comparing that to influenza-like illnesses and as a percent marker on the, on the y-axis of ED visits. Now, the numbers here may not be reflective of something that your ED is sensing, but as you look at pandemic planning and emergency preparedness, this could be, a again, a proxy marker that would show the intensity. The examples here at an index of one in the baseline state um, all the way up to an index of five when the pandemic was in its throes, the x-axis represents the week of the year, for your organization that had a particular uh, baseline, you could say uh, that this data would represent um, impact to the ED at five times your baseline. Looking at other data points that would cooperate, maybe it's not five, maybe it's only four, but certainly that helps ground organizations in their pandemic planning emergency preparedness planning with these, um, with these indexes. When you work at uh, this type of data, any support that could relay whether it's ED pressure, it could be ventilator durations. We know with this particular disease state, the length of time on a ventilator was elongated. Any and all of those data elements would be used in these sort of a planning. As we look at navigating the drug demand and shortage planning, even the New York Times has published on essential supplies. Over these past several weeks, the headlines, this is a headline from April, but it really could have been as much as yesterday. Essential medication supplies are running low. I would like to point out that essential here not only means medications for treatment, but also those medications for supportive care. For example, oral care for ventilator patients. If chlorhexidine was a part of your oral care strategy, there will be a run on those in the same way other organizations have the same oral care, uh, clinical care guidelines. This next infographic while in, intense from its uh, size of font, certainly having a recorded webinar will allow you to pause uh, for full um, review. But it was, it was described, it was created to describe uh, phases pre, during, and post pandemic or epidemic. Although I'll not 
talk about each point, I would like to highlight two spots along this path. First, and fully recognize that items as first-line therapy might be in short supply. Those first-line therapies will be exhausted. And going to your P&P committee with policies, protocols, even approvable substitutable items will need to be reviewed. For example, in your preference of a drip that would be a fentanyl drip or your choice of agent, your second line therapy to approve both its concentration, its use, uh, moving through the entire analgesic category would be preferred to do that up front uh, with your P&T committee. Your antibiotic structure, antiviral structure, second, third, and fourth lines of therapy. The second bullet point I'd like to highlight is the drug inventory decreasing while patients are on therapy. Recognizing and calculating your current supply burden um, and when it will be drained, this analysis, as Joni mentioned on a previous slide, should be done at least daily, if not more often, will be essential for all caregivers when patients would have to, that are on therapy, when they would have to be switched over to alternate therapies, forecasting the demand, and then how that affects your ability to do purchasing of, again, second, third, or even fourth line agents. The clinical care changes um, for existing patients is so key and critical for their continued care. Just a couple of highlights on that page. But Donia, when we reflect on the analytics, would you comment further about the data and analytics organizations might use during a drug shortage? Thank you, Perry. We've touched on data and analytics to help us plan for surge care needs, but drug shortages can be an especially difficult problem where analytics become crit crucial to organizational survival through the crisis. We've discussed the importance of trace tracking key data elements, such as drug inventory levels, but speed to data acquisition becomes even more important than usual in this setting. Spreadsheet lists with counts manually updated daily can certainly achieve that goal, but partnering with vendors to use existing abilities to automate parts of that process can impact how quickly alternative drugs can be deployed for a shorted drug. As drug usage patterns increase for medications such as sedation agents, rapid PAR level adjustments, ideally anticipating surge usage, ensures that ADCs don't stock out of critical drugs. Leverage any t technology solutions your vendor may offer, such as BD's health site inventory optimization solution that allows bi-directional PAR changes to be made from a single place for all ADC machines. Eventually, many drugs on the short list will require substitution. Anticipating when those will happen is a key goal in the use of analytics tools. And from the heart of the crisis in New York, Dr. Dabistani shares this perspective of what these principles look like in real life. In the end, these management strategies are critical to ensuring that none of our patients run out of the drugs needed to keep them alive. Perry, the question of access to data has become very important in this pandemic. What are some other ways we can use analytics to help us support the demand needs we're seeing? Thanks, Joanna. What a poignant quote from the heart of the epicenter in New York, where reality was, in fact, drug shortages and making those criteria changes. But we know other analytics are important. We've discussed data from CDC. We discuss other areas that would be 
very broad data. This slide would depict some of the work that uh, BD has done to visualize the data in several different views and to assist in looking at demand planning. I'll briefly walk through the slide just for uh, description sake. Looking at uh, particular categories of, of therapies in a pandemic and COVID is being described here, but certainly can be done to data visualize another uh, epidemics. We chose three different categories of the anti-malaria therapies, antibiotic therapies, and then sedative. The graphic clearly depicts when the surge hit at this particular location and comparing this to a days of therapy by a particular class certainly gives uh, an awareness to how much the impact is being felt. Naturally, these lines, even the small, uh, small text, would say that these are on a magnitude level as opposed to simply a small percentage change over time. That is one area where analytics could certainly support the demand, knowing the volume of impact being used on a patient as opposed to uh, purchasing in advance. Another way is to look at the medications in a generic way. Um, certainly in the pharmacy world, we know that uh, medications uh, were at different sizes and different strengths and different uh, package sizes and the like, but looking at them in a generic way where an organization could evaluate how much morphine is being used as depicted here or azithromycin or albuterol, all are important therapies being used in treating this current pandemic. And relating that to the size of the demand also could share with, regardless of the vial size, the packet size, this is how much product is being used at the time uh, for patient care. And then looking at uh, matching that to your facility, you've done, as organizations have planned for expansion, um, particular areas and age groups where those are going, the type of med that's being used could also help you identify in a particular uh, epidemic or pandemic, looking at a pediatric ICU versus um, adult unit versus maybe a geriatric unit, again, based upon disease states and all that um, an organization would be tracking. So again, this slide looking at different ways of analytics and supporting of demand planning. We think about prepping now for what we know with the COVID-19 patient population. As we mentioned, the ventilator piece and the intensity of care, um, a good number of COVID patients are in fact uh, being on the ventilator for a long period of time. Dan Kishner, who's with Abizient, had this quote, we can't lose sight that ventilators and the medications necessary for those patients is a one-to-one -one equation and the demand isn't going away. We thought about that quote as, Donia, maybe some more specific examples around prepping for the specific COVID-19 patient population. And could you walk us through some of your findings? Thank you, Perry. In summing up the recommendations discussed, the foundational principle is that our patients depend on our care systems to survive this disease. Preserving the integrity and viability of those care systems is the key goal here. So let's recap the principles we've addressed. As a starting point for managing drug shortages, creating lists, track quantities daily, and have at least two alternatives to each drug lined up, and very likely three to four as backups. Be flexible and nimble. Prepare to switch alternative therapies quickly, as usual therapies are depleted very rapidly, like we've seen by the dramatic utilization rate increases of drugs such as propofol, fentanyl, midazolam, and other similar drugs, even those such as oral hygiene maintenance for vented patients. The surge numbers are truly impressive. 
up to 600% increases in the utilization of those drugs. All alternatives should have associated usage guidelines and plans to quickly update IT systems should be put in place. For example, IT staff should be at the ready, able to update libraries and order sets quickly as alternative drugs are stocked. Clinicians, such as physicians and nurses, should be trained on how to order and then administer those alternative therapies. IV infusions of certain meds becomes much more complex. Be prepared for large quantities and adjust dosage form volumes accordingly. Larger bags of certain drugs, especially those used for sedation, will very likely be needed, such as this example for propofol reported by some hospitals. This allows nurses to limit the number of bag changes needed for these meds. Finally, use all data available to create forecasts and projections for supply is one of the most powerful strategies in ensuring continuity of care for patients. Perry, in closing, what other resources can we recommend? Well, Donia, thank you. The COVID-19 resources, certainly BD is uh, happy to post and share our MMS COVID page. You see the link being displayed. But I would be remiss if I didn't highlight several other areas of resources in both industry uh, with uh, ASHP site listed as well as ISMP. Again, focus on medication safety and patient safety in those environments as well as our colleagues within the group purchasing organization, link for Visient, Premier, and Health Trust. The number of other resources available, whether it be from AHA, CDC, others, are very well known. We thought we would add these today as some of the group. Uh, these might be new. Donia, thanks for your uh, presentation today. and. Thanks everyone for your time. And on behalf of Donia and all of the BD associates, thank you for your time and expertise caring for patients in this time of pandemic. <laughs>